All right. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, to show you a little bit the work that we're doing here on, on Long Island. You know, right now, New York City and Long Island are not having a great time. It's kind of complicated. So for this half an hour, let's let me try to get into a good positive spirit to show you what we're trying to do here, uh, which is basically create uh, a first version of a quantum network uh, that actually combines all the beautiful things that we like about classical networks that are basically amazing to uh, concepts of quantum mechanics, right? And then the objective of this uh, conversation today, we'll just give you an introduction about what these quantum networks are, right? What are the components? Why are they so interesting to combine them with uh, classical networks? And let's let's just start. So just to just to start with a positive note, right? Normally they tend me to give these talks because I do live in a quantum superposition these days. I actually work in Stony Brook University, right? That's in Long Island, about one hour from New York City. And I also have a joint appointment uh, with Brookhaven National Labs. And this will become important as we describe uh, what are the projects that we are working on right now. So this is a little bit of an outline of the talk that I would like to discuss with you. So then basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna start um, describing what is this concept that is called quantum communication, right? How this departs from the, from the usual communication that we use right now right, to communicate the internet and all signals in fibers, right? Then we will discuss a very important concept that is called a quantum repeater, right? This is basically the holy grail of quantum communication. And as I will tell you, there's a lot of groups around the world that are trying to build it, right? And then just to, just to finish this conversation, uh, we'll discuss a little bit about the prototype of these types of networks that we are building on Long Island, trying to connect Stony Brook University, Brookhaven National Labs, uh, and the city of New York, all right? And here I have some art, you see it here in the, in the first slide, that already tells you more or less what these quantum networks are about and what we will be discussing. Here you see that we have some quantum information that is flying in the form of photons that are moving one by one into optical fibers. And in order to create this new technology that will allow us to do uh, quantum communication distribution, then we have to interact these photons with atoms, right, and systems that can hold to the information these photos are carrying. So this is the artist's conception of what these quantum networks look like, all right? So then we're gonna go immediately to this introduction to quantum communication. So then it is important to make a, a homage to everything that has come in the past and that I believe is basically uh, one of the greatest achievements of humanity, right, which is the creation of the internet. Right? And I want to touch upon three important topics here, right? That are basically the basis of what the internet is these days. And, and the first one, right, is, you know, the creation, right? Somebody figure out that it's possible to transmit information over long distances by simply modulating lasers, right? If you make pulses and then you can perform amplitude modulation and also phase modulation of the signals, then you can encode lots and lots of information that then can travel over fibers and, and as you have seen in some of the talks in this conference and some of the talks that will come later, um, there is a possibility to connect gigabits of data, right, through many places through, through the world. I find it amazing. And I actually, as you've seen, uh, now that we are in this terrible crisis, the only thing that actually kept everything together and nobody from going crazy is the fact that we have the internet and we can do these things that we're doing right now. Uh, the second thing that is extremely important in order to achieve this long distance operation, right? Uh, at some point in the 70s and 80s, governments spent a lot of money to create a network of fiber that is basically communicating many places along the world. They even place fiber, you know, through, through the Atlantic, also through the Pacific. And it is with this fiber network that now we can transmit these amplitude modulated pulses so then we can exchange information. And then finally, right? Uh, if you put it all together now with uh, the quantum internet TCP IP protocol, you can use these physical developments to then make what is now the internet, right? So now, what is different about these quantum networks with respect to these uh, considerations that we all uh, use and, and like very much? So 
The first difference will be that normally we use uh, in these pulses, we're using basically millions and millions of photons to encode uh, one bit of information, right? So basically in this pulse, they can be millions or you know 10 to the 15 photons per pulse, and that will carry only one bit of information. In quantum mechanics, what we want to do is instead of encoding the information into pulses containing many photons, now we want to do encoding the information in only one photon at a time, or for example, two photons at a time, right? And this is the main difference of the two stories, the physical parameters of it and the network of fibers, that's something that we want to still use, right? So now, then there is two things that are very important, right? The first is, if we go into this direction in which we want to do um, communication with single photon level signals, right? Now, because photons are indeed quantum particles, what we gain from this is basically the possibility of putting these photons into a superposition of states. So for example, if you think about the polarization of that photon, now if you're doing experiments photon by photon, now you have the possibility, just as indicated here, that now that photon as a quantum particle can now be described in terms of a superposition of two states, right? And this is what we call um, a quantum bit of information. And then say, for example, this can also be applied to some other systems that are not necessarily optical, such as, for example, electrons or atoms, right? So then the principle here is going to be, we're going to be using qubits, and this is going to be our main bit of information, right? Superpositions of photons that are flying there. The other thing that we have in quantum mechanics that doesn't, that doesn't exist in the classical world is entanglement, right? So entanglement is basically correlations that exist between two different particles that are obtained when you create the particles in a specific way. For example, in an optical system, like the one that we have here in the top right, uh, this is a way we can generate optical entanglement and then we can create uh, correlations between two photons. I remember in the previous slide we described that we can send qubits of information one by one, photon by photon. Now what we want to do is encode that, but have two photons sharing correlations. And the way this is done, you see here you have a laser, and then this laser is pulsed, and eventually this laser hits a nonlinear crystal. And by a physical process that is called parametric down conversion, you can basically convert a high energy blue photon into a pair of two red uh, photons, right, conserving energy. And what is important here, right, you can play tricks with the way you do this. And say, for example, if you have a couple of nonlinear crystals, right, then you can imagine that you have a blue photon coming here. Then either this crystal will generate two photons, or it's just this crystal will generate two photons. And if you play around with the parameters of these crystals, you can basically play with the polarization state of the pairs of photons that are coming out. So then just basically by playing around with the polarization of the uh, master laser and the position of these crystals, now you can create states. You have them here uh, in the bottom right. These are the so-called Bell states, in which, for example, either you have two horizontally polarized photons or vertically polarized photons, but you actually don't know Right, because on a shot by shot basis, you cannot tell which of the pairs you have. This is one state, right? And these states are very important in quantum mechanics because these states are non local, which effectively means that if you send one of these entangled photons into a fiber and the other photon into another fiber and let them propagate over a long distance, if you make a measurement in one, you then will see an effect in the other one almost immediately, even though they are propagating over a long distance, right? So now using these concepts that we just described is basically the basis of what is called now quantum communication science, right? So quantum communication science is gonna be uh, the development of this new type of quantum networks in which we can transmit qubits of information and we can also share entanglement between remote locations, right? So that's basically the idea. I show you here a few examples of these types of networks that have been created in the last, let's say, three to four years, right? We have networks, for example, in China between uh, Shanghai and Hefe, 
right? It's been advertised recently quite a bit. Uh, there were some, for example, in Calgary, in which uh, Professor Tittle did an entanglement experiment over uh, 16 kilometers of fiber in the city of Calgary. In a couple of very beautiful experiments by Professor Anton Seilinger uh, from the uh, University of Vienna, right? Uh, changing, exchanging entangled photons over the Danube River, or also in the in the Canary Islands over free space connections of about 100 kilometers or so. so. This is something that has been going on already for for quite some time, and we understand very well how to do these measurements and how to make uh, the analysis, so then we can check that after long distance propagation, those photons remain entangled. Uh, recently, there's been some developments that are, are amazing, actually. Um, you know, Jiang Weisman group from, from the USTC in China, they launched a satellite that contains one of these entangled photons, and now they can distribute these photons across, well, various hundreds of kilometers, right? They have now a telescope that can receive these units, and they have reported uh, a few really very nice experiments. So, so this is an area that is basically exploring. There are many groups that are doing this. And basically, in the next two slides, I would like to describe a little bit what is the relevance of doing this in the context of enhancing the classical communication networks that we use every day. So one of the possibilities, one of the things that quantum networks can provide uh, that can help classical networks, and I have to be very clear in this, it can help, it can enhance, but it will never replace, right? It will never replace because simply classical networks are very good. So one of the ideas, right, is to enhance the security in data transmission using a concept that is called quantum cryptography. So in this concept, basically what we want to do is we want to encode uh, cryptographic keys optically and then transmit these qubits, these random qubits over, uh, over a classical communication network like a fiber and then we can do measurements. And then, because now, because in the principles of mechanics, if you have an eavesdropper, you will alter the quantum state that you're sending. And therefore, the person that is receiving this will know that an eavesdropper is trying to communicate, uh, is trying to, to get your information, right? And it's very important. This is um, as in terms of useful quantum technology that has already been demonstrated. Quantum cryptography and the, cap, the fact that you can create quantum protected keys is one of the most advanced uh, systems that you can have. There is uh, two or three companies in the world that are already selling these devices, and you can use them for distances um, between 10, 20 kilometers. Uh, there is a couple of experiments very important. There is one, one in China in which several of these cryptographic systems are cascaded, and now they can have uh, 100 kilometers of uh, quantum cryptographic systems. Recently, in the United States, of all places, in uh, in the beautiful of Chattanooga, uh, there was also a quantum cryptographic experiment in which several of these systems were concatenated uh, in the context of uh, protection of power grid. Uh, so that's very interesting. And then, so remember, one of the messages to take home is you can use the transmission of qubits through fiber to then quantum protect messages. And if you think about this, then you can still have a classical network exchanging data but now you can have keys that are protected. Right? So this is one of the one of the important aspects of this. Uh, the second aspect, and please forget the all the physics equations. I'll, I'll try to describe this very briefly. Is something that is very important, and maybe you might think this a little bit as coming from your favorite sci-fi uh, television series such as Star Trek. Right? This is a concept of quantum teleportation. Right. Of course, in Star Trek, people apply quantum teleportation to humans moving from planet to planet. That's, of course, not possible. But in this case, we want to do a quantum teleportation of qubits, right? So in these experiments, we use the beautiful of quantum mechanics. And basically, what we want to do is we want to communicate a qubit from one place to the other place, right, almost instantaneously, um, by using the communication highway that entanglement creates. I did the two things that I was telling you in the previous two slides. So basically, there you go here, right? In this diagram, you can see it. The only thing that matters is now you have two of these uh, photon sources, as I described at the beginning, right? And the only thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to detect one of these photons, right? For example, this one here. Mm -hmm. And by detecting this photon, we know with almost 100% certainty that there is another photon here, because remember, they're always in pairs. 
then we can prepare this guy into our favorite uh, qubit, right? Remember, qubit has polarizations, just as the one that is shown here in red. And then what you do then now, you use entanglement, right? Here on top, you will have entanglement. And then what you do is you put one of these entangled photons into a long fiber, and then you send it to a place that is several hundred kilometers away. And then what you do is the, the remaining qubit and the remaining entangled photon, which are these two here, you're going to do a measurement on them, right? And the outcome of this measurement, right, will actually um, project the state of this entangled photon into the state of the original qubit that you have here, right? And this is due to the fact that these Bell states, this is why they are so powerful, they can be used to describe the state of general polarization states of many photons. And when you do the proper projection, then you can basically move the qubit, which in this case is, remember, the most fundamental information that you can send in quantum, and then you move it from one place to the other one through a entanglement measurement, and this is what is called quantum teleportation. So then people envision, right, that quantum teleportations, once we understand how to scale them, can be used to move a large amount of data if you are able to encode large amounts of data into uh, large systems that are entangled, right? And of course, the, the question comes here, how do you do the measurements to recover the information, right? That's something that we are still uh, developing, but then, you know, that's kind of like the big vision. So then something to keep in mind, right, in the context of, of communication, and if somebody asks you, what can what can quantum do for you? Then you can say, well, it then told me that you can do uh, communication that is protected by quantum mechanics, not by algorithms. And he also told me that eventually, at some point, we might be able to transfer large amounts of data using the entanglement highway communication. I'm sorry, let me just take something. All right. So now, so this is this is where we are now. The only problem that uh, we have in order to scale these networks <coughs> is the fact that photons, as they move in fibers, they get lost, right? And this is what this slide is going to tell us here, right? So as photons are moving in the fiber, we're going to start losing them and losing them. And in classical communication, this problem is solved by putting amplifiers every 50 or 60 kilometers in the fiber, then you can amplify your classical signals and then eventually it reaches a point where you want to get. This is perfectly well established. And then there are uh, subsystems along the way between different cities that actually do this amplification process. In the quantum networks, we got to think about something different because um, in quantum mechanics, you cannot do amplification in the classical sense because that will violate a very important theorem that is called non-cloning theorem. Uh, you can non clone qubits, you can non clone quantum states. So therefore, we have to think about something else, right? And, and, and this is important. And then it's going to bring us to the, to the next concept, right? So in order to do useful quantum networks that can converge over long distances, that then we can use to do secure communication or to do data transmission with entanglement, we have to be able to manage to somehow, let's say, amplify the entanglement so then it can reach further and further. Right, and then this is going to let me then now to the uh, to the second part of the conversation, which is basically the introduction to what is called quantum repeaters. Right, so quantum repeaters are these devices that are going to allow us to amplify entanglement. Okay, and then in order to explain what the uh, um, amplification process is, I just put here another slide, and this is very similar to that teleportation experiment that I showed you before. But in this particular case, we do not want to um, project one of the entangled states that we have here into a qubit. We just want to work with two entangled states. So then these two are entangled and these two are entangled. And the only thing that we're going to do is we're going to do another measurement, right? one of these projective measurements. But now it's going to be between a photon of each of the pairs. right? Remember, this photon and this photon, they were not entangled at the beginning. right? So we're going to do a measurement. right? And then once we do this measurement, depending on the outcome of the measurement, what we're going to do is we're going to project these other photons that now we send into these long distance fibers. If the measurement is correct here, these two photons are going to be projected into an entangled state. Right? This is, again, a property of the fact that those very famous Bell states are an orthonormal basis of the space of the four photons. So if we do the right measurement, 
then we can project the other two into an entangled state. And this is a very important concept that is called entanglement swapping, because this is a way we can make entanglement go over longer distances. In this case, we had to put, you know, sometimes people say when you have a problem, you have to throw money at it. In this particular case, our problem of solving the losses is by throwing more entanglement at it. And then even though we lose entanglement, we still manage to have enough entanglement in our end nodes, right? And then the way it works in order to then distribute entanglement over long distances, here we have it in this slide, right? At the beginning, you want to distribute entanglement between A and C. So then now what you do is then you start breaking your long link into a smaller link. So for example, here, A, D, W, and C, and even smaller links, for example, A, B, C, D, W, X, Y, C, and each of them right, will have entangled pairs, right? So then you do it in such a way that attenuation doesn't kill your entanglement. And then in the intermediate nodes, for example, here, X and Y, D and W, B and C, then you perform these entanglement swapping measurements, right? So you perform the swapping here, swapping here, swapping here, then you eventually end up with entanglement between A and C covering a very long distance, right? So this is exactly the quantum mechanical equivalent of amplification of classical signals, in this case, applied to the concept of entanglement, all right? So this is actually very important. This is the concept of how quantum repeaters work and why, let's say, for us, the quantum communication community, building a quantum repeater that works is basically as important as building a quantum computer that works, right? So it's a really important problem to solve. Um, all right, so now, in terms of making a realistic network, right, uh, well, you might imagine if we are using fibers uh, that are already there, that everybody uses for classical communication, we cannot guarantee that the distance, for example, that this Y photon and this X photon travel is the same. So therefore, before making this measurement that requires that the photons arrive simultaneously to our detectors, we need to have a means to buffer the photon, right? In a way that, for example, if one arrives first, then you can delay it, that you can buffer it, and then when the other arrives, then you can make the measurement. And you need to have this means to buffer in the quantum information in every single node where you do the measurement, right? And that brings me then to another very important concept, right? These buffers that are used to um, basically change the timing of these quantum information signals, this is what they call another very famous term, they are called quantum memories, right? So then basically, in this slide here, I show you what the concept of a full quantum repeater looks like, right? In this case, you have two entangled sources, you see it here, A, B, C, and D, right? And they travel into fibers, right? These dotted lines will be fibers, let's say about 50 kilometers each or so, right? At the end of that, then you're gonna have these quantum memory buffers, systems that are able to grab that photon. Remember the photons travel at the speed of light, so it's not a trivial matter. They have to grab it, and then they have to wait, 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 and after a certain buffer time, then they can uh, release it in synchro synchronously to the other photons in the network, right? So then you see we have four photons here, then therefore we need quantum memory buffers, four quantum memory buffers, and then in the middle, we have to do the entanglement swapping operation. So then at the end, we ended up with entangled photons between these two uh, long distance nodes. Like in this case, it will be about 200 kilometers long, right? And um, the holy grail for us in this area, right, is that eventually we want to be able to um, convert this and show that having all these devices, it actually works better than just having one entangled source and going through the losses. At the end, the generation of entangled pairs that people in these days call this fancy name e bits, the generation of entangled bits needs to be better with their repeater, right? And this is what you see here in the right. Eventually, after a certain distance, you start getting exponential advantage in the number of e bits that you create over long distances by using this quantum repeater. All right. So then now um, I switch gears a little bit, and then what I want to show you is how does the hardware that you use to build these networks is uh, is built. All right. And so then I'm going to do it here. So this is basically a little bit the concept of these quantum memory buffers. So you see it a little bit cartoonish. Uh, some of you in the audience might be very young. You don't know what this is here. This is what is called a diskette, right? But anyways, you know, in my days when I was in college, this is the one that we used to, to store information. 
So in the way to think about quantum memories is basically as these systems in which you can store these qubits, as you see coming here, uh, for some time, right? And then basically here you have it. Basically the photon comes in there. You have a system in which you can then buffer the information. Then the, the qubit, the information itself, can then wait there. And then eventually you can retrieve it. Uh, I am an atomic physicist, and this is exactly the part in with the quantum optics of the entanglement mixes with the atomic physics. And here, the systems that we use to build these quantum memory buffers are based in uh, atomic clouds, basically rubidium atomic clouds that you can control with uh, laser fields, right? And this is what I have here uh, in the next slide. Here you see a picture, so you can already see more or less how this hardware looks like. So then basically, uh, here is where the entangled photons come in there. Then here you see this scan. This scan inside has the rubidium atoms. And then all these optics that you see here is exclusively dedicated to control the physics of the atoms here in such a way that then we can buffer the entangled photon when it comes in and out of the atoms, right? And here uh, on the left, then you see that basically this experiment in which you capture the entangled photons and then retrieve them, it has to work for all possible polarizations. And that's exactly something that we demonstrated already a few years ago uh, in my lab in, in Stony Brook. Um, what we're doing recently, right, in the last year or so, now we're really going into the development of these networks. So remember in that cartoon that I show you, if you want to show how a quantum repeater works, you need four of those quantum memories. So in, in the last years, we've developed a, a fleet of these quantum memories. And here you see one of these experiments in which we do a bell state measurement after memory memory buffering time as intended, for example, in that bell measurement um, experiment. So here you see the memories, it is memory one, it's in memory two, and then you couple the output of these memories into a fiber, and then, then you can do your bell state measurement here, right? So basically, now we can do experiments with many memories, and what is very interesting is that even though they are independent systems, the output of the memories, which is basically this output of entangled photons, now it can be remixed and nothing particularly awful happened. There is not so much noise, there is nothing. And the fidelities in which you can do this process are already very high to think about doing something uh, something interesting. So something, uh, some other stuff that we've been doing, right? Uh, in classical communication, I think many of you are familiar with the technological blueprint that is used in amplifiers. When you have fiber exchange points for classical communication, everything is basically mounted in racks and everything is just fiber in and fiber out. So in the last year or so, we came out with, with this device. Here you see a picture on the left. This is what we call uh, portable quantum memories. These are systems like the ones that at the beginning we had in optical tables. Now everything is packed into a shoe box, into a 16 inch rack. And here you see a picture of one of these quantum memories already deployed in the field in one of these fiber exchange points. And then you can see here in the circle that even though that quantum memory is deployed, we can tele, uh, tele control it. So then we see the, the effect of this, right? And this is very cool. And we actually have a patent on this. Uh, we're trying to develop this so then we can do more and more of these memories if we're ever gonna do uh, true long distance quantum communication. Um, the other part of the software that I would like to show you here is uh, the entangled sources, right? In this particular case, the entangled photons uh, need to have very specific properties because you want these photons to interact with the quantum memories that I just showed you, right? So you can buffer the entanglement to do then the swapping and then the repeater operation. So in order to do this, um, you gotta do a lot of tricks. This is kind of like the beauty of quantum optics. Uh, in this particular case here, you see here on, on, on the top in the center, what we do is we have that crystal that I showed you before, Right? This is where you generate the pairs of photons. But in order to reduce, right, uh, basically to fix the wavelength and to reduce the bandwidth of these photons, we actually put everything into a cavity. right? And by carefully selecting the mode of that cavity, then the photons that are coming out are going to have exactly the properties that we need to interface them with, uh, with atomic systems like those quantum memories. This is a cool experiment. Basically, I don't know if you can see here in the, uh, at the end of the entangled source, we have a picture, right? We have a picture of those photons. This is on in a, in a single photon sensitive camera. And you see the two photons, right? This is basically a little bit of a selfie that those photons took of themselves. And then you see here are the two photons, right? And each of them, you know, they are entangled. 
right? And they are uh, also able to then transition to quantum memories. Then from there, they go to fibers, and then from the fibers, then they go into the quantum memories. So then uh, the message of the second part is basically that now we have the technology, at least the first generation of technology, that will allow us to start building these quantum repeaters and possibly these uh, entanglement-based entanglement quantum networks. So in, in the last... Uh, in the last part of the presentation, then now I will tell you how is that we're building this network. We started about um, a year and a half ago. This is a collaboration between Brookhaven National Labs at Stony Brook University. We want to actually build this first version of a quantum repeater network, combining all this technology that I show you, now really testing the hardware over long distances, right? And uh, here you see a, a, a few experiments. This is an entanglement distribution experiment that has been performed uh, in Stony Brook University last year. Right here we have a fiber exchange point where we put an entangled photon source, and then we send one of these photons to fiber and the other photon through fiber. And then the experiment here requires synchronization in a way that you know when the photons were generated. So then you can measure simultaneously here if you want to search for coincidences that then tell you whether or not those photons are entangled after the propagation in the fiber. And then here you see a signal, right? This peak here, right? This is basically the coincidences over a particular time window that needs to be found as now the fibers actually don't have the same length. But this is basically telling you that the photons remain entangled. And now it's just a matter of interfacing them with, um, with the quantum memories. So then you can do the entanglement swapping and the repeater operation. Um, so that's exactly how it looks in the in this repeater experiment that we want to that we want to make, right? Here, remember, this is a cartoon that I showed you a few slides ago. In order to build a quantum repeater, you need two entangled sources, you need four quantum memories, and then you need a measurement station. And this is exactly what you see here in the slide. These are actually pictures of the hardware that we're doing here, right? So we have two entangled sources. The picture that I showed you before, we are building a second entangled source with the help of BNL. Here is a picture of it. Um, and then now we have four memory systems, the two that I showed you before, and the two that are portable and deployable, that then they're gonna go to another two nodes of this one, right? So this is basically the implementation of the concept of, the concept of this quantum repeater, right? And this is something that at, as, as, as two weeks ago, this is something that we were testing, but now unfortunately the lab is gonna be shut down for like three or four months. So the quantum repeater will have to wait until everybody is healthy again. Um, anyways, just to, uh, just to finish here, let me show you now the big challenges, the big challenges that we are now trying to address is, as you see here in the picture, all of these systems work at a wavelength of 795 nanometers. So then the 795 nanometers are not necessarily the better wavelength to work with long distance fiber optics. So then something that we're doing recently is show that all these systems are actually able to work also at telecom wavelengths. And that's uh, that's exactly the experiment that we were doing about like a month ago. In this experiment, what we want to do is we want to use uh, the 795 photons that are produced by those entangled sources. Remember these entangled photons. And then we want to pass them to these memories and use these atomic systems, not only to store and buffer the information, but also to change the color of the entangled photons so then we can send them into long distance fibers, right? And this is done by manipulating uh, the atomic systems in a way that they can create the colors that you want. And this is just basically a, a matter of atomic control with lasers. Um, the end result of this is basically you start with 790 photons, 795 photons that are entangled, you put them in your quantum memories, and then after doing this uh, four-way making procedure to the frequency, you ended up with entangled photons that are at a wavelength of 1367 nanometers, which is the O band for telecommunication. And now you can then send these over long distances. And we have tested this with a very long fiber connection. As you see here in the map, this one connects the Stony Brook campus here on the left to the Brookhaven National Lab campus over a distance in fiber of about 68 kilometers. So then the experiment that we're trying to do right now, right, is basically have a couple of quantum memories in the Stony Brook site, as I already showed you, emitting photons, convert the frequency of those photons into uh, the telecom, then have two fibers that are going here from the two labs, and then in the distant lab in BNL, then perform our Bell state measurement, 
And if we do this, then we're going to achieve entangling two quantum memories over a distance. You have to combine these times two because it's two fibers of about 140 kilometers, which we already, which will then already demonstrate that this technology can help us to then build uh, quantum repeater networks that work over long distances, right? And then just to finish the talk, uh, there is a couple of things here. Um, these are the experiments that are being performed right now. So basically what we have is we have sources of qubits that operate at this 1367 wavelength, which is the magic wavelength with quantum memories meet telecom, uh, telecom wavelengths. And now we transmit this to the fiber. This is what you see here in the pulses. These are basically qubits as they are detected on the other side. And now we're basically doing the experiments to uh, convert the frequency back into the 795 nanometers. So then we can do the buffer operation and then we can perform that Bell state measurement here. So this is actually a prototype of a quantum network in which qubits are already flying over, you know, 140 kilometers. And now we're just trying to then do the part of the quantum memory. So then we can start establishing um, entanglement swapping operations. So as this is basically the, the, the status of this network. And then just to finish, um, I would like to say that now the idea is to, uh, on top of this quantum hardware, we would like then to build um, a classical network in which we can use these quantum networks to do uh, cryptography. Right? So we can use the network to do uh, key encryption. And then we can apply this to a classical network in which we are connecting these uh, several nodes. Um, so then we can have classical analysis of information that is quantum protected by, uh, in this case, quantum cryptography over long distances. So this will be, if you want, a very preliminary concept of what the quantum internet is, which is basically a combination of quantum hardware enhancing the operation of classical networks. So then just to finish the conversation, um, the, the take message home is these networks are already being built. Right? I just show you the example of what we're doing here on Long Island, but of course there are many examples in the Boston area, in China, in Delft, in the Netherlands, you know, in Munich, in Germany, in which people are pushing these experiments uh, further and further. So, I mean, with that, I, I'll, I'll, finish my, I'll finish my talk. I hope I give you a good overview about what are these networks, what are they useful for, and how is that you build them. And, you know, I mean, hopefully I motivate you that, you know, in the, in the next days you just, because we have nothing to do at home anyways, you can actually look it up online, what these quantum networks are learn a little bit more about. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present this. And I'm very happy to take your questions. Uh, I'm a little bit sleepy because it's like 5.46 in the morning here, but uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Eden. That was uh, really, really uh, exciting. What, uh, where we are heading with the technology and uh, of course that uh, stays true you know, the topic uh, really fits the the, the frontiers uh, name of our conference that's that's what i've uh, really want to focus on things that that are being discovered and and tested and uh, trialed and uh, one day they will be applied widely so now we have uh, questions yes we have first uh, question from alain uh, oh, this is great. So yeah. I'm going to read the question. Is that okay? And then I'll give please, an answer. Please, is that please, okay? please, please read okay. the question. So uh, this is actually exciting. Alan asked, ask, um, is this quantum memory for communication can be used in a quantum computer? Uh, and what is the maximum size of a quantum memory today? Uh, so yes. So say there's a, there's a couple of difference, right? Um, Quantum memory buffers that are used for communication can be used for quantum computing in, in the concept that is called QRAM, so quantum RAM access memory, uh, but you have to be able to multiplex them, right? So in a computer, you need to access, you know, like a hard drive that has many, many, many uh, qubit storage devices. So then, yes, they can be applied with the sense principles, but you have to be able to multiplex them so you can have hundreds of thousands of qubits stored in, in the same memory. Right, so that will be that will be my answer to that one. And um, I wonder what does it mean with the uh, maximum size of the quantum memory today? Um, I would say answer this in terms of qubits that you can store. So uh, there's a couple of experiments that have been able to store approximately 126 qubits 
in a, in a multiplexed memory like this. So we did an experiment just like a month ago in which it seems feasible that in these room temperature systems, you can store up to about 100 qubits. So that's about the size of what that QRAM for a quantum computer could have these days. Um, yeah, so then you can think about that you can put several of these memories together if you want to date, say, for example, 1,000 qubits, right? And then to, in order to do this for, for quantum computing and distributed quantum computing, you need to be able to then interface these, um, let's say, buffers or sets of buffers to quantum gates that then can perform the logical operations to do computing. I uh, hope that answered the two questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I uh, can't see any more questions.